Fantastic. Well, hello everyone, and I'm very happy to welcome you all. And thanks for joining us for the first panel discussion in our seven part series, The World Awakens, where we're gonna hear from a lineup of experts on the long-term benefits of building distributed teams. I'm David Holland from Employment Hero, uh, where I lead our efforts to assist clients to understand how distributed teams can help them build great teams and grow their businesses. I'm joined today by our CEO and founder, Ben Thompson, partly as co-host, but as someone who has spent the, been at the coalface of uh, the evolution of employment and the building of teams for nearly 20 years, Ben has spent a lot of time thinking deeply about the way we'll be working in the future and what business leaders need in order to support that. So good morning, Ben. Morning, Dutchie. Thank you. The World Awakened series has been designed to explore the opportunities, challenges and practicalities of managing a distributed employment. At Employment Hero, we're set on our mission to make employment easier and more rewarding for everyone. We believe that the future of work is global, it's diverse and connected and flexible and fairer for all. And those characteristics deliver better outcomes, not just for businesses, but also employees. The next step in achieving that vision is getting more business leaders on board with leveraging remote and flexible workforces. This can be an intimidating prospect for those who believe they need a physical oversight to reach the highest levels of workplace productivity. We'd like to not only challenge those beliefs, but also guide leaders through how they can make the permanent shift to a more sustainable future for their businesses. Before we get stuck in with today's discussion, I'd like to thank our team who have worked to put this series together. In particular, Julia, who has led that charge and is also online today uh, curating questions for Q&As. So please add your thoughts to the Q&A box and hopefully we'll have some time to get to most of them. And thanks to you all for joining us today and being open to hearing more about remote work. This is a rapidly evolving area for businesses and just by being part of this conversation, you are likely to be in the box seat to take advantage of the opportunities it presents. I now have the pleasure of introducing our panelists for today. Uh, Gemma Lloyd is co-CEO and founder at Work180. Good morning, Gemma. Gemma is an award-winning entrepreneur and Work180 is the trailblazing job board working with employers to break down the barriers that are still holding women and consequently businesses back. She's a passionate advocate for diversity, equity and inclusion and Gemma regularly provides expert commentary for media including the ABC, Channel 7 and the AFR. Uh, Reepa Patel is a director at, the leading, at Leading Mindfully Australia. Uh, Reepa studied a diverse range of topics from law and psychology to I think yoga. Uh, looking at her profile. Uh, she's the author of Elevate, A New Path for Leaders to Navigate Uncertainty. She's a facilitator, executive coach, and board director. And she's known for her, ins her insightful and compassionately challenging approach and works with leadership teams and boards to increase engagement customer satisfaction to help businesses grow by engaging hearts and minds. Uh, and for finally, Omar. Omar's the co-founder and CEO at Vivo. Uh, Vivo is an AI-powered skills assessment platform that helps companies hire the very best people by focusing on who can actually do the job, uh, not who looks good on paper. Their tagline, Make Hiring About Merit, reflects their focus on removing the bias and assumptions from the hiring process in order to focus on the ability of the people to do the job. So morning, Omar, and thanks for joining us. Very briefly, for those of you not familiar with Employment Heroes background, uh, as a practicing lawyer, Ben's early career gravitated towards employment law and he subsequently spent the last 20 years helping small and medium-sized businesses navigate the complex role of being a compliant and effective employer. Having helped clients solve similar problems over and over again, he really realized it was time to create a complete, fully integrated and scalable cloud platform that could actually help millions of SMBs. Employment Hero was born from that belief in 2014, and today we serve over 6,000 businesses and their 300,000 employees. So with that done, on to today's discussion. Um, in thinking about the distributed employment uh, entire series, we realized that we needed to start with some kind of framework. Uh, the, if any of you have spent any time thinking about this subject, you will very quickly realize that there is no single definition. Every business is slightly different and everyone's on different stages of their journeys. So what we thought we'd start by doing is asking some of our panelists to actually share what their experience with distributed teams has been in their businesses so far, um, what their current status is and, and what models they've adopted and where they might be on their journey as a way of framing up the, the subsequent discussion. So um, I might start with Omer, if, if, if you're available, have a chat about what Vivo is doing in terms of distributed teams and how you're approaching remote first. Thanks, Dachi. So 
Um, at Vervo, we have been globally distributed and remote from day one. And when we say distributed, we mean we're in, in multiple locations around the world. And when we say remote, we mean people have the flexibility to work uh, from home or from a location of their choosing. And they're two different things. So there are companies that are where all the staff are in one city, but they work remotely, they work from home. Um, or you could be distributed, but have offices in different cities. Um, and we did this for two reasons. The first reason was we didn't really understand why um, when looking for the best person for our company, we should limit ourselves to an arbitrary city that happens to be the city where the founders live. Um, and so we kind of somewhat ambitiously and naively thought, well, let's just get the best person wherever they are in the world. And at the time, I think we were oblivious to some of the challenges that that would bring at scale in terms of the constraints of time and, and geography. And the second benefit was, the second reason we did it was we thought, well, it'll be actually great for the employees because um, they can kind of um, work in a way that, uh, that suits their life and that'll allow them to do their best work um, and be happy. And a great example, our first full-time hire, Jen, who now leads our customer success team, is based in Dallas. And, you know, I remember still um, to this day the discussion around, you know, Jen would do the carpool with the kids um, at three o'clock. Um, and so she'd be offline from three till, you know, whatever, putting the kids to bed and then um, come online in the evening, which actually suited us really well because then it was morning in Australia. Um, and she's in Dallas. And so like those were the things that were very natural to us when we started the company and it evolved that way. And um, we're in th on all three major continents. We've got people in the US, in Europe and in Australia. And then what we did during um, as the sort of uh, as we grew, we we actually opened offices, but not everyone was in the office. We had some people in um, different locations, but people had the choice to come to the office and um, usually people would work from the office part of the time. And then during COVID, we shut down all three offices. We had an office in Melbourne in Collins Street, an office in Dallas and an office in Kiev in Ukraine. We shut them all down and we went to 100% remote work from home. Um, and that was part of what helped us keep the team together. Um, we kept it, we basically took out that cost base. And so now we're 100% we're remote again um, and distributed. It's been... Um, you know, largely very positive, but there are certainly challenges around, you know, um, culture, um, the social aspect of people want to get together. People sometimes want to get together on a whiteboard and kick stuff around. So I don't think we figured everything out by any stretch, um, but the good outweighs the bad by a long way for us. Yeah, well, hopefully we'll discover a few more answers and be able to share some of that with our audience over the coming weeks. But um, so, so just to clarify, you you had strong elements of remote and distributed coming into, into the outbreak of COVID and, and you, that actually helped you through COVID. Exactly. So when we shut down our offices, it wasn't a shock. It wasn't a big sort of change or transition for people. It was, um, there were a few little things like some people didn't really have a good setup at home um, and some people live in, you know, smaller accommodation and working out of the kitchen and all kinds of, it depends on what city you're in as well. Um, but other than that, it was a very smooth transition for us because we were used to that. People were used to getting on calls at 10 p.m. or 7 a.m. because of the, the time zone. That, that's always been an element of our company. And even in the people that did work out of an office, part of the time they worked from home some of the week anyway. Yeah. So it was quite a natural transition. I will say, though, that we did hire people during the peak sort of lockdown period of COVID, people who we only met in person many, many months later. And in fact, there are people in our company that we've never met still because they're in, on, in different parts of the world that we can't even access now. Yeah. Um, and, it's, and, and I think there's a difference between that versus people that you've worked with in person at some point and then gone to remote, but, but you'd previously had lunch with them or worked with them in an office. So that's, yeah. that's something to think about as well. Yeah, we've got, uh, we've got a lot of time to do, work through all that. Um, Gemma, Work180, uh, where are you guys at and what's your approach? 
Yeah, sure. So very similar to Omer's journey. Um, we're now at about 40 people and we're distributed across 15 locations. So we're 100% remote, have never had an office. Um, and it started when my co-founder and I launched the business. I was based in Melbourne. Uh, sorry, I was based in Brisbane. She was in Melbourne. But even when I moved to Melbourne, selfishly, neither of us wanted to commute. Uh, into the city or an office. So we designed it actually in a way that we really love to, to work. Um, but there have been a lot of um, advantages. There's been a lot of challenges along the journey. And so some of the advantages similar to Omar is the access to talent. So kind of COVID stuffed that up for us a little bit because now everybody's jumping on the remote working uh, bandwagon. But prior to that, we were able to attract, you know, amazing talent from companies like Atlassian, for example, where I don't know if we necessarily would have been a business they would have wanted to join unless we had those additional um, perks and benefits. Um, also, you know, getting great talent that live in remote locations like the Sunshine Coast and things like that. Um, so in terms of some of the, the challenges and downsides that we have, um, communication is certainly one, being very purposeful, being very structured around how we disseminate uh, information across the company is really, really important. Um, cross team collaboration has been a has been a challenge for us. So um, we've now facilitated um, programs. What we where we have a program called Knowledge Exchange, and so we have people from the marketing team, finance, sales, etc., uh, get into a project group and they work on a discrete project as a team together. And we have three three of those running at the same time. Um, so it allows for people to get to know each other across the business, whereas they wouldn't outside of their, their silos, I guess, for lack of a better term. Um, the other piece that's a challenge is around just um, people's well-being and making sure they're okay. In an office, I think you can pick up a lot more if somebody uh, is having a down day, whereas if you're remote, you're obviously not seeing them. So the leaders um, are very, really make sure that we're asking people regularly how they are and getting to know people on a, on a personal level. Um, but implementing things such as employee assistance programs. We also have a mental health first aid officer at the company where that person's available for anyone to talk to um, anytime and share if they're having challenges. So um, there's, yeah, pro, definitely pros for me, pros way outweigh the cons. I am never going back into an office personally. Uh, and I don't think any of my staff will, uh, would want to either. Um, but yeah, it's just about that, that, that real structure and being purposeful how you, how you manage it. Great, great start. I, I think it's going to be interesting as we explore this over, over the course of today and, and weeks, um, uh, the difference between organisations that have traditionally been uh, office-based who are moving to remote versus somebody who's established from remote from, from day one. But uh, uh, ben, perhaps, uh, you know, Employment Hero, we've, we must be 300 people today. Um, what yeah, we, we've got a slightly different story to, to um, the others. So on the 13th of March 2020, we had, uh, when, when COVID was sort of breaking out, we had an employee come back from leave with a suspected case of COVID. And that threw us into um, not an evacuation, but we, we, had to, we had to leave the office and start working from home. And I think for the first, which was fine, we'd actually spent the previous couple of years working on uh, using objectives and key results as a management framework. Uh, we, you know, we, we are on Slack, we were, we were sort of set up to work in some ways remotely. We had half of our company based in Vietnam and the other half based in Sydney. Um, and so getting sort of being forced to go and work from home wasn't a complete shock. And, and we actually noticed over the first six or eight weeks that all of our productivity measures, the, the, the code commitments, the support tickets that were answered, we saw um, great improvements in our productivity over the first couple of months. But we still held the desire to get back to the office. And we were missing the, the camaraderie. We, had, we used to do a thing on Fridays where we had a chocolate wheel um, with all the different fast food restaurants around our office and we'd spin the chocolate wheel and then go out and get a, a, a communal meal and they all eat together um, in the kitchen on a Friday afternoon. Turns out that everyone replaced the other restaurants and it's only KFC that it comes up on our chocolate wheel. But um, we, you know, that was a great part of being in the office to have a communal meal on a Friday and then at, at 
you know, 5.30 after our all hands, we'd have, we'd have drinks together. That's the thing I miss the most. But we quickly adapted to remote first and the benefits have, like you have both said, have far outweighed the, the costs. There are certainly people who would, you know, and myself included, who would still enjoy to go the camaraderie of those events, but we now have access to way more talent. And so over time, because we haven't been able to go back to the office or not all of us, we've decided we're not going back to the office. It is still there, our, 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 what we call our hub in Sydney. We don't want to call it an office because we don't want people thinking that's where you have to work. It's um, completely voluntary. Um, it, it serves a very important purpose for particularly for, as Omar alluded to, some younger people in the organization who are living in share accommodation and can't work productively from home, you know, from the kitchen with, with flatmates. Um, but over the last, I'd say, so for the first couple of months, it was, it was all new and exciting. The next two or three months, we were figuring out when do we go back to the office and starting to sort of count down the days to going back to the office. And then we quickly pivoted to a realization that we were limiting our access to talent and remote first was the way for, forward for us. And I think we've we've landed firmly in that camp for the last sort of six months. We've been remote first, and we'll stay remote first. Yeah. So Ben, in terms of our the current status for Employment Hero, we obviously have the hub in Sydney and the hub in in Ho Chi Minh, which are a, a legacy offices. But over the last year, we've employed people from all over the place. What about those people who can't access that? Who who are more than an hour from one of those cities? How, how are we set up for that? Well, I think those people have been recruited on the understanding that they will be remote first. So um, it's it's part of the role. It's but we've we've selected them for their desire to work remotely. We will also um, we are introducing in August. We will have what we're calling our first gathering. So our whole of company gathering. Obviously, this year with the borders closed, we won't get everybody, but our teams from New Zealand and all over Australia will um, meet together in the Blue Mountains in the in the second week of August for three days. And, and, and that's where I think if we can make that three day social event, um, basically replace all of those KFC meals on a Friday and all of the Friday night drinks, but com compact them into three days. I actually think that people will be raving about that event for the, for the remainder of the year and looking forward to it, to the next one. And it will, it will, it will be just as good for our social, um, our social side of our businesses as being in an office together every Friday. Yeah, awesome. Um, Reaper, your, your, your own business uh, and experience lately and perhaps um, maybe some broader comments on what you're seeing uh, in terms of the models being adopted. Yeah, um, so I set up my business 10 years ago, coming out of an executive role, which was heavily located in, in an office. Uh, and I made the decision a bit like Gemma, um, that I was going to have um, the lifestyle that I wanted in, in terms of my business. Uh, so whilst I have an office in Collins Street, it's in a, in a co-working space, which I love because I go in and I feel like I'm surrounded by people and like-minded entrepreneurs. And so, you know, the buzz of the office is really important to me. In saying that, my business um, has always had staff uh, and employees that are distributed and interestingly, so to use Omer's term, you know, are also working remotely themselves. Uh, so I hired someone new in March in my team. I had never physically met her um, until last week when we, when we had uh, breakfast in the city in Melbourne, which is where, where we're both located. My other staff member is in rural New South Wales. And why? Because like Omer said, I wanted to hire the best talent for my business. My business is never going to be, you know, at scale. So I've made a, a conscious decision and a strategic decision that my business follows more of a practice model. Um, so it's never going to be large groups of people. However, I always wanted to hire the, the, the best talent. Um, COVID didn't impact us that much because we, we were already working um, you know in, in a distributed model uh, we've got the tools that we use and, and so that just continued um, if I can kind of offer a different perspective in terms of my clients um, there, are, there are a couple of things I would say so most of my clients are mid-sized or large organizations and most of them had people working on site 
And so they had to move obviously to working remotely very quickly and had to adapt. And particularly for the larger clients, that was quite an endeavor because uh, as you can imagine, you know, moving several hundred people offsite overnight, you know, it is something um, that they hadn't necessarily thought about, but are now I would say embracing much more openly. So the larger organizations that I work with, some of them have actually made the call that the majority of their employees, you know, will now be working remotely. Um, there is another kind of interesting piece that I'm seeing, which is um, with those mid-size and large-size organisations where they've got project teams, they even if if they're uh, if the large part of the team is either working remotely or um, in some kind of hub that project team often is working um, together, but off-site from, from headquarters or off-site from the actual main office. So that's an interesting um, dynamic that I'm seeing around remote working as well, where you, you know, an, an executive might have, uh, you know, a group of 350 people that report to them. And she's also got a um, group of 35 people that are working co-located with each other on a particular project, but not, not sort of co-located with the others. Um, so that's, that, that's quite, a, quite an interesting thing. The other thing I'm seeing now, uh, and you know, I work in the leadership development space, is something that, that Ben mentioned, I think, which is bringing the team together. So um, where, where we've got executives or boards that um, for people who are you know, located elsewhere in the country or even not so much overseas in Australia yet, but certainly uh, elsewhere in the country, bringing those people together um, to build trust, collaboration, accountability, and to develop strategy and, and a, a plan forward. So instead of being co-located, rather using two opportunities a year to come together in a facilitated way where the owners of the business or the directors or the senior managers actually come together and, and, and work on a, a strategy or a plan that they can implement over the next six months. Yeah, okay. I, I think it's um, really paramount that for the Employment Hero gathering that we're planning in August, um, that, that the day-to-day -day work is, is not the purpose of that gathering. And we're not gonna overwhelm everyone with lots of strategic presentations. It really, perhaps the biggest priority is just to create those relationships and, 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 and bonds with people so that when we do go back to our, our remote work, then we're, we're able to communicate better and overcome some you of You better make sure there's a KFC nearby. <laughs> Katoomba, I've checked it out. Um, so <laughs> moving on, um, the, the purpose or, or the intention for this series is very much to uh, start to develop very practical uh, solutions and tools and tips that uh, our, our clients and our, our users can take away to help um, develop distributed teams in their own businesses. And we're going to be digging into that very deeply throughout uh, this, this, this today and also the rest of the series. But what we'd like to do first up is, is to get some of the challenges on the table um, and we're going to ask each of our panelists to share what some of their biggest uh, problems they've had to overcome in a practical sense. But also, if you can start to put your own thoughts into the chat, uh, we'll be using this to help us scope discussions and, and address problems. If not today, we'll certainly be addressing them in the context over the next uh, few episodes. So please feel free to add your questions and your, and your, your opinions uh, into that, and we'll curate that, if not today, uh, in subsequent episodes. So Gemma, maybe I'll come to you first. Um, what's been the, the biggest challenge uh, that you've had in, in, in managing and, and perhaps implementing your distributed team? Um, the biggest challenge for us, which I did, um, I touched on before, was probably around communication or lack thereof, should I say. So, you know, in those early days when we were really building out the team, we didn't have processes by which we actually took information out to the company. And so there were instances where decisions would be made and it wasn't, um, it didn't really cascade down in an effective way, nor were the right stakeholders actually engaged uh, properly in those communication decisions um, and we were sort of in the earlier days much more much more we're still agile but even more agile so we would quickly make a decision run with it and people um, digest information in different ways and so it's not enough often to mention it we um, Julia when we when we set this up mentioned zoom fatigue 
So by mentioning uh, something important only via Zoom is not an effective way of disseminating information. So you've got to make sure that it's on Zoom, it's on Slack, and probably via an email or in some type of wiki, like a, like a confluence, for example, with, with, with Jira. Um, and the second piece that I, that I mentioned is that, um, that team building, I feel like I'm part of a, a team. So we used to do the, um, we used to have a biannual uh, whole of company gathering, um, similar to what you're doing at the Blue Mountains. We did ours at the Gold Coast. And when COVID hit last year, we weren't able to do that. And we really found that that did break down, I think some of that, those relationships that people had on a more personal level, because we used to walk away from those conferences, buzzing, like buzzing after seeing each other. Um, and so what we've done, and um, now that COVID's passed, is we have state-based catch-up. So we have lunch or dinner, you know, every month together. And um, we also have a social uh, Zoom event every week, which um, that was implemented through COVID. And so it might be a trivia night or um, some type of other fun game that, that's remote to kind of build those uh, relationships outside of, outside of work. I think the way that one of our team members um, sort of worded it was people don't have necessarily a release valve. Whereas, you know, when you're in an office, you get, you go for the Friday drinks, you wind down, you, you relax. And so how do you be purposeful about facilitating that, that release valve? Yeah, you, you've mentioned the word purposeful um, a couple of times. And I think uh, having a deliberate approach to some of these solutions and problems is, is, is critical. We'll probably come back and visit that. Um, one question I was going to ask you all, but I think it's probably unfair is, is if you only had to have one single tool uh, one single software platform to, to to help you through remote and distributed, what would that be? But we might come back to that. Uh, I think it's a, a difficult question to answer. Omar, um, biggest challenge that you faced in terms of, of working with distributed models? Yeah, I mean, I agree. So I agree with Gemma around communication. And so I'll add something different. I think a trap that is easy to fall into, and we see a lot of companies falling into is being um, binary and one size fits all and, and saying we have to be all this or all one way or all another way. And what that does is it, it, it excludes people, um, which is not only unfair to them, but it's also just not, it, it's just not smart in terms of sort of productive um, functioning of the company. So, and I'll give an example. So, so we decided, for example, that um, we want our engineering team in the one location because they need to be in the same time zone and they need to work. Now they work from home right now, which is fine, but they can catch up for coffee. Um, and we may or may not have some office arrangement in the future, probably not full time, um, but they're together. Conversely with sales, we made a very uh, deliberate decision that they're going to be where the market is, where our customers are. So they're currently in the U S and in Australia and, um, already they're already sort of asking questions about when we put someone on the ground in the UK and also sales reps can work more independently and um, you know there are different uh, constraints around different markets in terms of cost and all these kind of things so so with sales we made a decision that it's distributed and that team has a very different operating rhythm to engineering um, and then sort of drilling down even further now we're talking about making a more junior sales hire in the U S and we actually want that person. We don't want that person to be like some sort of like random remote person without mentoring. And that's not going to set them up for success. So we might want them in one of the cities where we already have a presence, but still working from home. So there's no, in our minds, it's not all or nothing, all remote, all distributed, all in the office. It depends on the team. And I think some of the mistakes that we've made or some of the things we found challenging is like, not being deliberate about that and, and just not, not looking at the team level. What is the rhythm, the operating rhythm of that team? How do they do business? How does that support our customers? How are they interacting with each other and with other teams? And letting that determine the way that, that they should work. Now, there are obviously trade-offs at the company level. I'm thinking about the KFC lunch and all that stuff, right? So, but for us, like we need to be present in multiple markets and geographies, that's a given. And so then around that, how do we organize ourselves in a way that lets people do their best work? And I think ignoring that and trying to impose some like one size fits all structure can be detrimental. Yeah, that, that's fantastic. In fact, we're starting to get some questions through about how to manage different types of people within an organization. 
Um, so I think your reflection that, that a, a binary approach, one size fits all is not the answer to, to successful teams. Um, we might challenge that later on in terms of whether you can build a team from scratch, uh, but also that time zone element. Uh, uh, Matt Mullenweg, who's famously built businesses like uh, WordPress, uh, which were famously remote first from day one. Uh, he talks about the five levels of, of distributed employment with the ultimate having to deal with asynchronous working, people working their own hours. And you actually see it today with parents who want to be offline in the afternoon to do pickups and stuff. Um, Reepa, perhaps uh, you can share with us some of your thoughts about the biggest challenges you've seen in, in, in managing distributed. Yeah, so uh, again, uh, would echo everything that Omar and, and Gemma said, but to add to that, if, if I look at my, my client base, um, there needs to be a fundamental shift in the way that we as leaders lead these teams because it, it requires a different way of leading. To give you a concrete example, all of us you know, have had Zoom fatigue during COVID. Why? Because when we went offline or, or remote, most people went online and so we just had Zoom meeting after Zoom meeting and, and you know, a, a lot of people just had back-to-back -back Zoom meetings scheduled because we needed to communicate and because we weren't seeing everybody, we needed to, to virtually see, see each other. Whilst that might have worked <clears throat> in a short space of time and it was an emergency situation for the first couple of months, that's not a long-term way of operating. So that, that's a really good example of um, we, we need to learn to lead differently. And so what I'm seeing around the work that I do with my uh, clients is how do we lead remote as well as distributed, as well as you know, people working in the office, so the hybrid version. Um, how, and to Omer's point, you know, everyone's got different needs. So how do I lead a sales team that works remotely versus how do I lead um, you know, a group of lawyers? My, my background is legal as well, Ben. Um, so you know, leading lawyers remotely is very different to, to leading a, a, a sales group differently. So I think we need to fundamentally rethink what leadership means and how we lead. I don't think there's a one size fits all answer to this. I think it comes down to what the organization uh, wants to achieve in terms of its, um, you know, remote slash distributed strategy. And on that, you then need to build the leadership model that's right for your organization. Um, I think uh, one of the biggest barriers in terms of um, distributed and remote working is if you, you mentioned this um, earlier, Dutchie, if you, if you, um, build a team or grow a team in that scenario, how do you build trust? So, you know, we, we were talking about the KFCs, we're talking about Friday night drinks, we're, you know, we're talking about the odd coffee, if you can debrief with a colleague, if you've had a tough meeting, you can, you know, you can say, hey, Dutchie, do you have five minutes for a coffee and you can debrief. That's not available to you if you're working in a distributed model, for example. Um, so how do you build trust? How, when I you know, when I do meet you, Dutchie, for the first time, how, how do I then feel comfortable in being vulnerable with you and saying, "Hey, I've just had a you know a crappy meeting. Can I yeah. <laughs> can I debrief that with you?" So that that trust element as well, I think, is a real challenge. That's not to say you, you know you can't um, you can't build that in other ways. It, it's more about making those conscious decisions on how to do that. Dutchie, can I jump in just on that point? Sure. So I think on the, it's interesting on the leadership and trusting. One of the things I personally found interesting and challenging is um, when you're working across time zones, geographies and office and home and all every variation of sort of remote working um, as a leader, you, you, you can't be as prescriptive as you might otherwise want to be. You can't say, right, everyone turn up to this place at 10 a.m. for a meeting or, or can I grab you for a sec or whatever, all those, those examples. Now, um, and for me, like that would make life much easier. Um, but what, what the sort of the other side of the coin is, people in the team get to go to their kids swimming and they get to like, um, you know, do the daycare drop off and all this kind of stuff without stress. 
Um, and so they actually like feel really good. And all of us and like half, probably half the people in the company have kids and kids isn't the only, it's like one big thing, but there's a bunch of other unrelated things that are unrelated to kids that the freedoms that people enjoy in terms of what they can do and how they can work. And what we found is the ability to do that gives people energy and builds trust because they can then, it's not this like trait, they're not constantly torn between work and their lives, they have much more flexibility to organize their day. And in the short term, maybe you could argue there's a productivity cost, but actually long-term there's a massive productivity and engagement gain, I think. And people just feel better and they've got kind of more like kind of spark in their eye because they're not having to choose between their lives and their families and their work. Now, as a leader, you sometimes like, you know, you sort of get, have to get your head around like, okay, things are going to be a little bit more abstract and more maybe chaotic, let organized slightly less, less structured than what it otherwise would be. But if you can tolerate that, then the benefits are immense. And I think that's kind of one of the things that um, we found helps potentially build trust for everybody. Yeah, look, I think structure is one of the themes coming through the Q&A that we'll come on to when we talk about benefits in a moment. But just to wrap up this, Ben, your reflections on the key challenges around remote? Yeah, look, I, th I think just to reflect on what people have said, firstly, purposeful, I think, is, um, is very important. You, there are some things about doing this where, you know, the world has forced us to, do, to make these changes, although some of us, some of you, Omar and, and Gemma, were already remote first and actually Reaper too. So... You didn't have to make as much change, but those companies that did have to make those changes, you know, there's a lot of change management has happened very, very rapidly. And one thing that I think we stand, uh, addressed early and it, it, it would have been our greatest challenge had we not been quite direct on this, which is um, how do you build equity into a business when some people are still coming to the office and some people are still working or have chosen to work from home. And what we, what we implemented very early on in the process was a all, on, all offline or all online rule. So in our business, unless every person involved in a meeting is in the same environment, uh, they're all physically in the same office or they're all online, everyone's online so that no one feels left out. And... Um, I think unless you adopt that quite direct position, you're going to end up with an us and them um, business. And, and that's the last thing you want is that people regret the other side. So managing that, that is, I think, the number one thing uh, initially around change management is to adopt an all, all online or, or no one online um, approach. The second part is um, trust, as you said, Reaper, um, that's what I've seen going on in the community most of all is, and, I, and I'll, look, I'll, I'm a white middle-aged man, so I'll, I'll wear it, but I think the, the white middle-aged men with egos who like to drive their nice car to the office and walk into their corner, corner suite and overlook their, their team of minions, that does something for, for people's egos that is, you know, they've lost a lot, those people. Um, they've worked their careers to be in that position and it's just dissipated, it's gone. And so I think, um, you know, we have to be empathetic of that, that, that there are a lot of people whose egos were built on their career and their position in their business. Um, and you don't get that sitting at home with screaming kids in the background and, and dogs um, <laughs> messing the place up. So that's, that's the other part that I think needs to be accommodated. Um, and then finally, just to wrap up, because we could go on and we are going on for seven episodes. Um, but uh, the, the final part is, is just that the, the benefits, and I think, Omar, you put it perfectly, there is a spark in people's eyes when they can balance, when they can make a meaningful contribution to um, a purposeful business, as well as a meaningful contribution to their family. And, and just to share openly here, I've got a, um, a child with special needs who doesn't go to school and uh, or not every day but, and needs a lot of extra care and the last 12 months I couldn't put a price on the value of being home with um, and being able to care for a family member and I'm at that age where my parents are getting old too and I'll, I'll need to be around for them so how do you put a price on the flexibility of being able to live a better life 
um, still be engaged in work, but also be engaged in family in entirely different ways. So um, really exciting times. And sorry, I did say I'd finish up on that point, but I just want to make one last point is work is like, I, I, I've worked on employment for 20 years. I look at employment at this monolithic social structure and in 20 years, it hasn't changed. People still get paid the same way. They're still covered by awards and industrial instruments. You know, leadership is sort of very um, glacial in its development. Everything changed over the last 12 months. The whole deck was thrown into the air and we have this incredible opportunity to put it back in a better way, in better order um, with, with, with greater flexibility. And we're seeing that across the board. So uh, that first point, Ben, you made about uh, the, the, the potential for different groups and creating equality, uh, I can see a couple of questions coming through around that. And I think that's a starting point. There's a great example in there about construction site with, with, with HQ. Um, we'll, we'll come on to that. There will be an opportunity for us to address some of these questions, particularly around you know, how, we, how you induct new starters. Um, in subsequent episodes, we've got our own chief people officer and, and, and some of her colleagues joining us uh, in future to talk about the way in which they're inducting and, and joining people. Um, I do want to just mention something that Greg Hill's uh, thrown out there. He, he talks about the biggest hard challenge being around technology. And I think we will have some great answers around that over, over the course of our discussions. And he highlights the biggest soft challenge being engagement and well-being. I think Gemma and Reaper have spoken about the, the need to do it purposefully and, and, and for leadership to adapt. Um, I, I really want to try and get into some specifics. So um, keep your questions coming and we will answer them, if not today, uh, over subsequent uh, opportunities. But now pivoting to, to where we've sort of been heading for the last uh, 40 minutes is to start thinking about why, 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 why remote and distributed teams? What are the key benefits that we're trying to unlock here? Um, I think a lot of the questions coming around how they deal with challenges, and we, we will address those, as I say, in the future. But um, Reaper, perhaps I can, I can throw to you in the first instance. Um, you, you're a big advocate of the, the, the what if, what, what if we could, what if we dream, rather than the self-limiting why, why not. Um, what, what, what's the, what's the, what are the biggest reasons in your mind to start to think about uh, taking a business remote? Yeah, uh, fantastic question. And I would couch this in the sort of back, backdrop that, that Ben did that, you know, if I think about my clients, they, they've moved from um, an, an office location into either remote or distributed teams. Uncertainty is certain now more than ever. As, as Ben said with his metaphor, everything's being thrown up in the air. We don't know what's coming next. As human beings, we want to control, right? We, we, we want to feel like we're in control. We're not. <laughs> we never have been. And I think the last 12 months have shown us uh, that in, in, in you know, um, sharp focus, if you like. So if uncertainty is certain, what can we count on as business leaders um, and as business owners? It's our ability to adapt, it's our ability to move quickly, and it's our ability to change depending upon what's happening. It's also our resilience, not just, and I'm not talking about personal resilience, as, uh, that is of course part of it. It's also about your leadership resilience and it's about your business's resilience because um, Rick Hansen talks about, you know, if, if the storms of life come, do you get rocked about or do you capsize? And the difference is resilience. So to me, resilience is not standing firm. It's actually moving around with the storms and then figuring out what's the right path forward. Given everything that's happened, I think that we need to fundamentally rethink, you know, how do we need to adapt our businesses and, and how do we need to change? And, and a big part of that is people are now looking towards, you know, as Omar and, and Ben said, I've got personal obligations and I want my work and life to integrate, not balance. Balance is impossible and that's a whole different subject that I could go into. But, you know, I believe in work-life integration. So if you want to drive um, discretionary effort, if you want to drive productivity and profitability, do it through discretionary effort. Why? Because it's more sustainable. And, you know, Omer's talked about this already. So if you do it through that and you, you, you give people what they want and what they need, more importantly, you're more likely to be able to garner their engagement, so that the, the head and the heart into your business, so that when the storms of business come, 
they are resilient with you and you know you, you can move forward so basically to answer your question there are no right answers at the moment nobody knows what the answer is and nobody knows what the future is in that situation we need to build resilience the only way to do that sustainably is to to engage your people um and the best way i know how to do that is to give them what they need yeah uh, how, how would you respond that there's a very common and i think legitimate question from people about productivity in a distributed environment um, some people take to, to, to it like a duck to water and in fact because of their personal circumstances, the way they're set up, the way they, their, their working style, as Ben said, we saw actually a huge increase in productivity ourselves where we can measure it. Um, what would you say to managers who say, I, I, I'm not confident that my team are as productive in their, in their front rooms, in their local cafe? What, 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 how, do we, how do we deal with that? Yeah, great question. So, and I've had this a number of times. The first thing I say to them is, you know, let's sit down and talk about which of your team members are not being productive. And let me ask you a second question. Were they productive in the office or not? And chances are that those are the same people that, that weren't productive. So there's something else going on there. It's, it's not about the location of that person. And then it's about, you know, do they need coaching? Do they need capability skills? Is it motivation? That's a whole different thing. The other question I would ask is, how are you measuring productivity? If we're measuring it by time at the desk, that's again a furphy, right? It's just, <laughs> I could be at my desk and watching YouTube videos and you wouldn't know, right? Um, I could, my mind could be elsewhere uh, and I could be planning the weekend and I'm not being productive. So how are you actually measuring productivity? I encourage my clients to um, use outcomes to measure productivity, not inputs. Because at the end of the day, you want that person to deliver certain things. So, so measure the outcomes that they're, they're producing, and particularly for knowledge workers. That, that should be, I'm not saying it's easy, but it, it should be relatively measurable. Um, if you're in, a, in an accounting background or a legal background or those kinds of backgrounds, there are uh, productivity tools that they measure, whether you agree with them or not. There are timesheets. Um, so there are ways that you can measure it. And I can tell you that the um, accounting practices and the legal practices I've worked with have said their productivity has gone up. In fact, they've got the opposite issue, which is they're trying to get their people to switch off when working from home because they're not commuting. So they're finding it so much easier to have dinner with the family, come back and flip the laptop up again and, and, and keep working. Um, so yeah, th those are the questions I would ask is, are they the same people, that, the doubts that you've got about productivity, are they the same people? And if, if so, how are you going to manage them, which is different, it's got nothing to do with the, their location? And secondly, how are you measuring productivity? Um, in my business, we have a productivity tool that we use. I use it myself, not because I'm measuring, you know, the productivity of my people, but because we, we want to see how profitable each of our products and services are. And so that, that you know, gives us all an indication um, of how productive we are, but also how um, certain services maybe we need to exit um, and other, other services we need to grow. Can I quickly jump in? Sorry, can I just quickly jump in there, Reaper? I think you've, um, when you say that there are if most, most jobs, knowledge worker jobs, and I think to some of these questions in the Q&A box where we're talking about a manufacturing business with some people who work remotely, that's a different different thing to deal with. So just dealing with pure knowledge workers, I've got a lot of um, friends in business and I'm really surprised that some of them can't get their head around how to manage performance, you know, how to measure performance. And it's a, you know, it's, it's like trying to see a color you've never seen before. If you have never seen it, you don't, I don't know what the right analogy is, but they don't know how to get there. And there's just such a huge opportunity to go out there and help businesses come up with their metrics for measuring performance, which will then allow them to trust their employees to perform well against those metrics, which will then allow their business to flourish in a remote world. Um, but I would say that the, the proportion of managers who actually are there and get those metrics, um, performance metrics, uh, it's, it's well under 50%, probably under 30% of managers haven't, have really got their head around it yet. And, and I would say, Ben, that the reason for that is because we have traditionally, in my view wrongly, but traditionally managed performance or assessed performance based on hours in the office. You know, oh, yeah, for sure. Bums on the seat. 
Yeah. We're, we're actually, we have an episode coming up, which is going to deal specifically with how to measure, measure performance and, and goal setting. Uh, and we'll talk about the tools, but but Reba, to sort of summarize um, the level of productivity, if it's done right, if you recruit right, if you mentor and, spend, and set up your, your team for success in a distributed environment, you're a promoter of the fact that distributed teams can be more productive because of work-life balance, saving the commute, giving people what they need. So um, uh, at the risk of oversimplifying that, that uh, fantastic uh, uh, discourse, um, uh, Je Gemma, uh, what are the biggest reasons that drive your distributed uh, journey? Reaper, I think you said that all wonderfully and covered up, covered up, yeah, sorry, covered off a lot of the things that I would have um, would have said. And the other things that I've already man mentioned is access to the talent that you wouldn't have access to before. Um, that employee wellbeing piece. I think that remote working um, really then allows for other ways of flexible working as well with the distributed team. So that might be different start and finish times. Um, it might be maybe working a compressed work week, for example. And so we're extremely flexible. We have, um, we have our measures and people can actually get to that measure and work in a way which whatever suits them best. Um, we've also introduced, and which is slightly off topic, but might be interesting in, in the context of productivity, a nine day work week at full pay for all of our team. Um, that's worked extremely well. Um, it's working really well for people's well-being and also those productivity gains as well. Um, and in terms of attracting and retaining um, talent. Thank you. Sorry, I'm just trying to curate a few Q and A's here while we're going. Um, so, so Omar, perhaps um, you touched on this early in some of your earlier comments about about why you chose to go go remote um, early. Uh, is there anything that in particular stands out that we haven't covered? I think it boils down to one thing, which is to create an environment where people can do their best work. And, I, and I'm not here to advocate for one model or another. I think every company has to find the model that suits um, it. But, but I will say that invariably that's in 99% of cases going to include very big elements of remote and or, you know, work from home, et cetera, because we're talking about human beings, not robots. It's not an assembly line that rock up at nine, clock on. Like that model is just working less and less and less. It's become becoming obvious. Now, there are definitely businesses, and, and I just want to be clear, like that doesn't mean no accountability. It doesn't mean no responsibility. Like absolutely, and accountability can be very granular. It can be we need everyone to attend a meeting at this time. And there's all sorts of things, but there's more that you know that that is not about like nine to five FaceTime in one location there are many ways to skin the cat and I think if you create an environment where you allow people to do their best work and that that aligns well with the company achieving its goals it's not easy but it's possible then everybody wins um, and that invariably will include elements of remote remote working and so that that is what um we believe in strongly terrific ben, ben i know that a lot of what's been said resonates strongly with your approach um we haven't talked about talent we haven't talked about recruitment um is there uh, i don't know if that's something you want to oh, i think about. i think that would yeah that's the like, we have spoken about it i think everyone said um talent is one of the main reasons but in our case you know we're a fast growing technology business we're doubling well over doubling in size every year which means that brings a lot of problems and you need a lot of people to solve those problems. We couldn't possibly recruit all of the talent we need from Sydney, you know, from 30 kilometres of our CBD office. Um, it's just, we would, not, we would not survive. We have to be broader than that. We have to um, access a world full of talent and, and remote first is a very simple approach to doing that. You know, you have to be remote first to, be to, to access the talent. So if you need talent, you have to be remote first. It's simple as that. Yeah, um, it's interesting. We, we've we've got uh, people outside of our, our hub cities for, for two main reasons. One is because that's where we've managed to find the, the great best talent, but we've also opened offices to expand our business during COVID, which has been an entirely remote first experience. So looking forward to meeting some of those colleagues over the coming months. Um, look, we've been overwhelmed with the questions. Um, there are some really clear themes emerging. 
uh, I think it's fair for it to say we're not going to be able to answer many of these now. What we will do is we're going to do a couple of things. Firstly, we'll take these questions and use them to shape our conversations over the coming weeks. Uh, we have plans to address a lot of these questions around employee engagement, productivity. There's a few uh, technical questions. Uh, what, we, what we're also going to try this time around is we're actually going to try and respond to some of these in the form of blogs and, and, and written Q&A. Uh, so keep an eye on our The World Awakens homepage. Uh, we may be able to email everybody that's registered with some responses, but we will definitely address all of these questions uh, in some form, either in future episodes or in written form. Gemma, there's one very quick question specifically for you around the nine day work week initiative. Have you written about that elsewhere? Is there somewhere people can go to check out how the nine day work week operates? I have not written about it and I need to, my marketing team's on my back, uh, you know, about doing that. But um, <laughs> essentially really quickly, um, everybody gets their standard pay as they you know, normally do. We pay market rate, but every second Friday, uh, that's a day off. If we have part-time workers, then essentially once they've worked the standard kind of um, work week, which is, um, you know, 38 or 40 hours, that once it gets to that much, depending on relative to their part-time, then they have a, they have a day off. Um, and it's been working incredibly, incredibly well. I don't exercise the nine-day fortnight, but I do love a day where I don't get contacted. I want to just power through my work. Um, it's incredible. So it's, um, yeah, we've seen nothing but positivity come from, come from implementing it. Yeah, terrific. Look, that, that, that also touches on a, another area of questions, which is around some of the technical questions around operational health and safety, remuneration, employment law. Um, it's an area that we have a great deal of expertise and we will absolutely address that throughout this, this series. Um, we do want to try and keep these things on time so that everyone can keep to their commitments. So at this stage, I am going to wrap it up rather quickly. Um, I'll do that firstly by thanking our, our panellists and we really appreciate uh, your time and your insights and your sharing your own experiences. We would love to continue to engage with you all. We will probably um, drag you into some conversations via social uh, and the blogs that we create. So for those of you who have joined us today, you will continue to hear from, from our panellists in that form. Uh, for the time being, though, um, I'd just like to uh, say thank you very much to everyone for joining us. Thank you to our panellists. Uh, please keep in touch with the subsequent series. We are going to address uh, all these questions, but this has been a fantastic start. So with that, I'll say thank you very much and goodbye. Thank you, everyone, for, um, for being on the panel. And for those people attending, please feel free to invite, invite your colleagues along to our future sessions. Thanks, Dutchie. Thanks, guys. Thanks very much. Bye thank for you. Now.